Hello, I'm Panos Kodzathanasis, and this is Asian Movie Pulse Interviews. Today I'm here with uh, UHI, whose film Wonder War recently screened in Singapore. How are you, UA? I'm doing well. How are you, Panos? I'm fine, I'm fine. Everything good, everything good. So tell me, I saw that in Singapore the screenings were sold out, you had to change venue. How, how was the whole thing? How was the reception of the film there? It was it was it was good. I was actually surprised that uh, after it was sold out, then they changed the venue. We opened up to sell a couple more tickets, and within eighteen hours, it was sold out again. Um, so, um, I, I and and what I was surprised is we have a lot of old folks <laughs> who turned up for the screening. I was actually. <laughs> Pleasantly surprised. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, what did the audience think about the film? Did you get any feedback? Um, so for the feedback with regards to this, um, I, my, I'm mo I was most curious about how Singaporeans will take it. And generally, for the lay people who come to view the films, like I said, I was surprised there were quite a lot of uh, non-industry people um, from the public. Uh, I think they really resonated with the dialect and the language that is being used in the film because um, it is not commonly heard now uh, thanks to our government's uh, aggressive approach to eliminating uh, a certain type of... I mean, eliminating in general all dialects in our uh, community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yep. And th this was your, your first feature film after 10 years, right? Uh, yes, it is. Yes, it uh, is. So... Wonderland is, uh, yeah, from the last one that was done in Singapore in 2013, now it's 10 years, exactly 10 years. Okay. Well, so what took you so long? <laughs> um, I think I got busy doing, uh, I, 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 just in case, maybe for a little background. You see this behind me is a film scanning facility. Yeah. Um, um, and actually around me, I'm, I'm, I run a post facility as well, uh, which over the past 10 years, I spent a lot of time building it. Um, we are Adobe Vision, Adobe Atmos facility as well. And I spent a lot of, uh, in the past 10 years, it became like a focus to build up the post-production capabilities of the facility and I'm grateful to say that uh, some of the clients that come to my facility includes people like Anthony Chen, Eric Ku, um, Hershu Ming, they, 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 uh, they, they're all uh, big filmmakers in Singapore in their own right. <laughs> mm -hmm. They come through my facility to do some work. Oh, Jack New as well, if you've heard okay. who Jack New is. <laughs> yeah. So, did you do the post production for your film in your studio, or <laughs> which is ironic? Um, this this is my first feature film that I've worked on in my facility. Um, I've spent more time working on other people's films than my own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, yeah. did you did you miss filmmaking in all those years that you didn't shoot features? Sorry, could, uh, you, uh, your audio you dropped out a little bit. Did you miss filmmaking? Um, yes and no, because along the way I did some short films uh, mm. in between. Um, and in a way, this story didn't come, was in development for many years, to be honest. Um, I think the earliest draft I have for it was about more than five years ago but I didn't quite like it. And we, in the end, by the end of the sometime early this year, we finally had a draft that was actually worked on by three different people. Um, and the stories took many rewrites before getting to the shape that it was today. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I mean, earlier this year, before we shoot it. Uh, so, although the inspiration for the story came about more than 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. So it was, I wouldn't say that um, I, I, I did, that I totally didn't, that leave the filmmaking world altogether. Uh, 
So, so in 2018, I did a, one of the short films. I did won the Grand Prix at Short Shorts uh, International, the Tokyo Short Shorts uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah, so actually I have been active just in different forms. Uh, I, did, I did a series, mm -hmm. two series in fact, one for Taiwan, uh, for CJ Entertainment, and then uh, CJ ENMN Hong Kong, and I directed three episodes uh, of a Netflix series um, that is uh, produced by, uh, that was shot in Indonesia, Batam, called Mr. Midnight as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't exactly leave, I just did different forms of stuff. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And, and tell me a bit about uh, the inspiration behind the story of the movie. I think I've, I've al always been... Um... Okay, let's talk about the very first spark. Like the, the first thing that actually triggered the film, which I would say I didn't want to... It's not evident in the marketing because we don't really talk about it. Um, in the film, there uh, is about a father who sends his daughter away for overseas studies in the United States, a Singaporean. Um, he lied to her that uh, I can't afford it, but actually he sold his house to do so. Um, and is the only daughter. But what happened was uh, she met with an accident and that news came through the neighbor who decided to cover the lie by helping to read and write the letters and eventually faking letters uh, uh, from the daughter as, and writing fake letters to the daughter um, in order to keep up with the lie. Um, when I was studying, in, I, I stayed in the US for six years. I studied there for four years and I worked there for two years. And during my final year as a student, my last year, actually there was a student, a, a freshman, that year that met with an accident. She was a, it's a Singaporean girl, mm -hmm. um, only daughter. And the father, mother, I, I can't imagine what goes, I mean, right now, I, I've been a recent father. So looking back uh, in, the, in the past few years when I got my own child, this story became more of an uh, urgency for me to tell that story because I think once you are a father yourself, you start looking at the world in a very different way. And I think that has propelled me to tell this story even more because I really wanted to tell a story between a father and a daughter. Um, and this was also a good opportunity to look into I wonder if it's a social, to, to sort of look into the social psychology in general, uh, where I think in Asia, we always look to the West as the wonderland, you know, mm -hmm. um, as the land of the dreams, you know, um, especially much more so uh, with my parents' generation. Um, even if you look at how our country's education, we are very much geared towards uh, the West. Like Singapore, in school, everyone must learn English. That's our main language. And all of the sciences and mathematics, everything is taught in English. The, we take O levels, uh, uh, levels, GC O levels from uh, Oxford, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, as our testings uh, in our schools as well. So we are very much in tune with aligning ourselves to see to the West. And back in my parents' generation, even I will say up to today, we still often look to the West as, oh, going there to have a better education, going to the West to have more opportunities. And I was using this film to sort of explore our Asian, Southeast Asian psyche, or at least Singaporean psyche of, uh, I, I don't know, could it be a, 
something that's left down from our colonial heritage, you know. <laughs> mm. Okay. So, yeah. so essentially, in your opinion, this whole American dream is a lie because the way you present it in the movie, it's the opposite. Like it's a nightmare. It's not a dream, you know. It's uh, it's interesting you see that because which is why I'm like, could all these be just an illusion? You know, this thing about looking to overseas as the wonderland. Maybe it's time we should look towards inwards and see, maybe, and question the concept of um, how do you pursue your dreams, you know? <laughs> and mm -hmm. how far would you go to pursue your dreams? Mm -hmm. And tell me a bit about the concept of flying in the movie. You presented it something benevolent, let's say, that people help each other by lying to each other, let's say. What do you think about well, lying as a concept? Yeah. Well, but you see, it it, it 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 plays into the entire concept of the film as well because uh, uh, the concept of wonderland, um, in a way, when you go to a wonderland, it's it's if everything is make believe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the in filmmaking is it, it's all make believe. Going to a wonderland, you 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 lose yourself into a a place that's not real, but you 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 immerse yourself in it. Um, and in a way, you do have to take a leap of uh, uh, suspense or disbelief. Uh, and to do so, a certain level of lying to other people or lying to yourself is necessary too. <laughs> um, and so lying is an under, undercurrent theme within this whole concept of uh, keeping up with the illusion of a wonderland. Uh, and, and, and in the end, I also want to question, right? Is, are all lies bad? Um, maybe sometimes lies are necessary to uh, to upkeep um, a person's well-being, um, psychological well-being. I don't know. Again, I, I don't think I put a hard and fast rule because in the end, the truth does come out. Um, but the lies, in a way, did help one another at, at least in the characters uh, where they are maintaining each other's uh, uh, ability to carry on from day to day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does, does it make sense? Yeah. yeah. And also, you show that um, there is like a gap of communication between father and daughter. It's due to the language, but in general, do you feel that this generation with the previous one, there is a problem in communication? Even beyond so language? This is yeah, so this is this is. Uh, I'm glad you noticed that because um, it's actually a very specific to our Singapore generation. There was a um, in around, uh, I think in the early early seventies, the government had a the change of of uh, educational system where they say everything will be tested and uh, taught in English, right? And this whole implementation and change of education wasn't done gradually. It was, it was done in one year. And as a result, um, my, my, my generation came along. I, I belong to that generation where, where there was a switch. Um, my parents can't speak English. Mm. And I had difficulties learning English as I was growing up. So... My peers, where their parents spoke English in homes, they generally had it easier in school. Uh, I mean, I, I, right now I speak pretty good English, I think thanks to also having the opportunity to live in the States for a couple of years. Um, but um, that what sudden switch in language, an entire generation to stop being able to communicate with our grandparents couldn't speak the, the, the in-between languages. My grandparents couldn't speak English nor Mandarin. I could speak Mandarin and English only. So I have lost the ability to communicate with both, both of my grandparents on the maternal and the paternal side. I, and I'm not alone. Uh, most of the people of my generation had this hard uh, separation uh, with communication between our generation 
which is a, a big pity because they, my grandparents got, went through the uh, World War II. And I often felt really bad that I was not able to extract, have the opportunity to extract more stories from them that could have benefited my generation, or at least in my aspect as a filmmaker or a storyteller, you know. Um, and could it be a pity that he, they were a lot lonelier because they couldn't enjoy, you know, that that connection with their with their grandchildren's generation. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. And tell me a bit about uh, the casting. How did it work for the film? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Are you familiar with uh, Mark Lee? himself yeah yeah yeah, yeah so uh for the people who's probably listening to this uh podcast uh this film has two um actors who are very uh established in singapore one who is very well, much more well known to be playing a lot of uh commercial comedy in singapore that doesn't quite travel very well outside of singapore um and um he's the one who plays the more serious role in singapore, in my film ironically um whereas peter yu has now sub somewhat of uh had a resurgence in, in recent years um uh, and he is somewhat of a darling for a lot of the art house films mm -hmm. uh where most of his roles are a lot more serious so but in my film, I ironically have them flipped where Peter is actually playing the more carefree character and Mark playing the more uh, serious and no-nonsense father kind of character. Uh, but from... And I, I, I think... Which I think kudos to the actors. Um, they were able to pull off their respective role really well because they are very good actors themselves. It's just that they were not given the opportunity to try uh, the, the kind of roles that they are given in this particular film. So um, I think maybe that's why a lot of local, for the local audiences who were present during the Singapore screening, many of them come up to me and saying they were surprised by the two actors uh, kind of roles that they get because it wasn't the typical role that they were used to uh, be cast in the recent years. Mm -hmm. And regarding the daughter? The daughter is brand new, actually. Um, this is actually her first major role in a feature film. Um, she was actually from, a, she's somewhat of an influencer in Singapore. So uh, during the screening, that there, there was a bunch of fans. I was kind of surprised. <laughs> uh, I didn't expect people to turn up with, with, with lights and 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 cardboards with their names and and you know I was like whoa okay, um, so it, it was by chance I I had an open call uh for an audition she came I I thought she was she was really good in terms of uh fitting into that role, um, but the tricky thing was the dialect like I said people of my generation and even younger she's much younger than I am, um they 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 couldn't really speak the dialect really well, but Mark and Peter, being the age that they are, they could. So the good thing is most of the film, uh, most of the character, side characters as well, they are all uh, people of 50 years and 55 and above. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so they were all very familiar with that dialect called Hokkien. So with actors, the younger ones who were not familiar, they, they were able to... Um, rehearse with them and brush up that dialect uh, Hokkien that made them felt really uh, authentic. Mm. Um, it, it, it's, it's really hard to, it, it's kind of sad because this, this Hokkien language in Singapore is sort of, uh, is very different from the Hokkien from where Taiwan and uh, the Fujian or uh, province in, in China because when that dialect come over to Southeast Asia in Singapore it, it took on its own form 
Um, even Malaysia, having people who speak Hokkien heritage, their accent is different from Singapore. So, so, so our Singapore Hokkien accent is actually, once it's gone, I think after two more generations, it, it might be a lost uh, language of sorts. Um, and I'm grateful that this, this film allows me to sort of preserve this very old mm. school way of speaking uh, that, that I think will serve as a nice time capsule for, mm. for many generations to come. <laughs> so Xenia, uh, thankfully she had some practice with her parents, though not great, but she had a good base. Mm -hmm. so, it, uh, so she spent a lot of time with Mark. Uh, rehearsing over the phone, in person, uh, rehearsing the lines over and over again to 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 get her lines correct. Um, but the key thing was I wanted them to improvise. So they actually had to sort of learn the language uh, themselves in order to really master it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so was it easier to work with the, the new actor or the veterans? <laughs> um... I think both were equally fine. Uh, once that, I mean, the language was probably the biggest hurdle that the, the younger ones had to overcome. But generally when I cast, I do cast people with good intuition and and I I cast them for their ability to, to portray that role. Um, not so much for whether they're pop popular or whether they look at the role. Um, and... Uh, Generally, most of the, like, there were, like, three younger actresses in the film. There's one that plays the the lady that takes care of the uh, community group. Uh, there's a daughter of the Peter Yu, um, who plays uh, the, another singer in the film. They, um, they all have some acting background um, from theatre as well. Uh, so that helped go to... Like I don't have to train them in acting. They 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 were already fitting the role. But these this is probably their first feature film, uh, major role as well. So I'm I'm kind of grateful that that uh, I'm able to get this group where they are. I, I like improvisation. I like people who who's on the spot. They are able to like oh rehearsal is one thing, but on set they don't have to come and ask me for permission to say, can I do it this way? Can I try this? Thing? Because, oh, this set is inspiring me to do things in a different way. And, 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 and I love it when they do that. So working with actors that are seasoned they, and they being free to do this, um, uh, to me, contributes a lot to the film. Um, it, 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 interestingly, although this, is a, this film is like a tragedy, right? Um, uh, and quite a lot of people were sniffing and crying throughout the, throughout the screening. I was like, yes, right? But what <laughs> I, I didn't share was actually on, on set, everyone was joking and having fun every day. Everyone was really smiling and happy. And, and, and you know, you wouldn't know that we are shooting a, tra a tragic film. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. All right, all right. Yeah. And tell me a bit, how is the situation with the Singaporean movie industry at the moment? It's interesting. Um, we Singapore industry right now, if you look at um, this year is a bumper year for the film festivals on the festival circuits because many films that were shot during or before pandemic were rushed in to submit for the festival. So this year had a huge load, has the most submissions Singapore International Film Festival ever had in terms of Singapore films. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had many to choose from, which they said this is in, in, in years. But the truth is, if you look at on production level, we are probably on uh, each year, local films that are shot. This year alone, we're looking at maybe three of maybe four, um, which is not very many. Um, but if you, there's maybe one or two more, but they are all they are local films, but shot in Malaysia uh -huh. because yeah. it's cheaper to do so. Um, <laughs> um, 
I think the, the the problem lies in 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 the production cost in Singapore generally, uh, for the crew could be higher than the region, and so it will make it will force you force the kind of films that you can make locally into a certain genre only, uh, which could um typically comedy or drama, uh, and you don't see so much of action or. or uh, maybe some and, and low indie horror, um, but in terms of commercial films, ironically, we I think we have art house films that actually outnumber commercial films um, being made, um, and this has been true for the past at least five to ten years, which is kind of bizarre because if you think about it, um, so this year I think is a great year for the art house circuits, uh, partly because of the environment, partly because I think government's funding also have a role to play in it. Um, uh, we are riding on a high when it comes to art house films, but uh, commercial, not so much. Mm. Um, in fact, commercial films in Singapore has not done well for the past 10, 15 years, I, I dare say, mm. which is... Uh, which is a concern, I think, because um, a, a, a country's output shouldn't be limited; should should have more diversity, uh, which is something that which is severely lacking in Singapore. Mm -hmm. But has the audience returned to cinemas after the pandemic, or still there is a problem there? Okay, generally we are, have not recovered as well as the region. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would say within the region, uh, Indonesia has way surpassed, in fact, surpassed the pandemic already. Um, has recovered and surpassed. Um, Korea, uh, I think, is somewhat recovered. Uh, Japan also, I think. Generally, most, most have. Thailand last year was not, but this year they have recovered. This two years, Malaysia has also gone back really bad really well um but generally for the ticket going audience in singapore we have not recovered that well i, I think it's not just because of content or maybe it is a mixture of content thing um you, if you look at the region the the recovery has been driven largely by domestic films and we singapore don't really have much to show might have contributed to it not growing uh, recovering as well, um, so that there are a lot of factors. I think I, 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 but generally, I don't think we have recovered uh, back to even pandemic yet, mm -hmm. pre-pandemic. Yeah. Okay, and, and tell me a bit more about uh, Mokatsai. How is the whole thing working? How is it going on? What's the future? Let's say. <laughs> for for Mokatsai, yeah. uh, so um, we are a post-production house that um, I started about 10, 12 years ago. And uh, in the past four years, three years, we have actually started to go into production as well. So um, on top of doing a series and two films so far, and we are in development for several series as well, uh, and feature films, we are moving into the um, the the content development and production side of the business as well. Um, that said, we in the next two years, I think Mokachai will seek to find a way to uh, go beyond Singapore even more because uh, we've seen some good results uh, in uh, working with co-productions to bringing like post-production to Singapore. Um, very luckily, um, we have a Singaporean producer by the name of General Mi Chua, who has uh, worked with us to bring Glorish Ashes, mm -hmm. as well as Shell, which was, um, the, the post was done in Singapore uh, for, the, uh, for Yellow Cocoon. Everybody, I think people might be familiar, it yeah. won the camera door this year. Glorious Ashes is the Oscar entry for Vietnam this year as well. Um, 
so we are very fortunate to be able to work on these films. And um, looking at our slate, we are looking to do more within the region with the Indonesian films and uh, Malaysian films as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, last questions. Uh, last question. I guess uh, new project as a filmmaker. What are you doing next? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I should share because you see, it takes years to develop a project, right? So, for instance, um, like Wonderland took, I would say, more than five years to find the fun rewrites to eventually get to the point where it was ready for. Um, and for the upcoming project I'm working on, I think it's going to take a few years to, to develop before we get to the point of, uh, of, uh, production, maybe at least two years. Um, it's going to be a Singapore film. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, I think it's dealing with a topic that, uh, internationally uh, people will be curious to know as well <laughs> uh, so I am I, I I don't want to share too much because uh, because again I, I don't like to uh, until the fat lady sings right and okay. I and generally I don't even like to share about the project too much until maybe it's going to production because um, I at the same time, I have several projects also in development. Um, but which one will be the one that says, hey, greenlit? I really don't know. Um, I'm also working on a horror project, mm -hmm. personally, because I, I'm a big horror fan. <laughs> um, every, uh, every director I ask from the region right now, they say they will work in a horror movie next. <laughs> ah, <laughs> yeah. We're going to so, have a lot so of I'm... horror movies, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean the first one I did my first film was a horror film 2009 you know mm -hmm. then the second one was 2011 so since then it's been more than 10 years uh, and uh, I look to see that oh maybe it's time you know um, do uh, my first horror film in 10 years you know <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and actually I, I did come up with a concept before but uh, we I co-developed this with a uh, with with a project with a director in Thailand, uh, but uh, I I can't disclose it yet. But um, we are looking to evolve uh, that one particular project, which uh, I which probably won't be directed by me, you know. Uh, but my own horror one is a different project. So I have several. Mm -hmm. projects all going on at the same time so um several horrors several dramas um but uh which one happens first i'm not sure but uh they're typical they're typically in the region the regional stories um uh, that i i with with i think uh yeah they're, they're, they're regional stories um and I think Southeast Asia movies will be uh, will be very in exciting place to uh, see films coming out from. I think eventually. I, I totally <laughs> agree with. I totally agree with that. Okay, that's it. Uh, if you are not cynical, if you are not cynical, <laughs> ah, you remember. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, right. because like you say, it's easy to get cynical, right? Hmm. Yeah, I've got people watching films and then they'll be like, oh, you know, this is not the kind of film I expect. And then why have expectations, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not so much about is this this kind of film or that kind of film. Why can't people go in and say, oh, did I enjoy it or not? I, I think that's all you need to come out of a film as opposed to wondering, uh, does it fit into this or fit into that? I feel these days, it's harder and harder to fill, fit films into categories. Mm. Um, what is at house may not be so clear cut anymore. What is commercial is also not so clear cut. And what sometimes is a horror film might not be fully a horror film and so on anymore. And I think people should just keep an open mind, be less cynical. And go in and say, hey, did I did I enjoy the film? Right? You know, did this film make me think? Uh did this film make me laugh? 
did this film make me say I want to watch more, right? Of mm. of, of other films. Uh, I think eventually that should be what we are. Uh, we 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 should be going into films about and not not so much over analytical on it and go with the feelings, right? <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. uh, and yeah, if anyone is listening to this before uh, Palm Springs uh, in January, yeah, we're going to be at Palm Springs. So if you're in Palm Springs, we have three screenings. Please come and catch it. I am only, unfortunately, only able to attend one of the screenings, which is the morning one. Uh, <laughs> so if you can turn up, please uh, do turn up. I'll happy. I'll, I'll be keen to hear what you have to what you think about the film. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Panos. Okay. See you later. Okay, bye. See you later. <laughs>